We've just been looking at a distance method called Cepheid variables to find the distance to a star or even a galaxy. What I want to do just in order to finish off is to review the main distance methods that we've actually looked at so far. So, so far we've actually done uh, a few of them actually. Uh, the first one that I showed you was, I'm going to leave a little bit of a space here because I want to do a little bit of writing, but the method here was called the parallax method. Actually maybe what I'll do, instead of doing that, I'll actually just make like a little table here. So I'll make this right here, I'll say, um, yeah, I'll just say here, method. Oops, I can't even spell, apparently. So this right here is the method. So there we're going to say, whoops, I can't seem to make straight lines, can I? Um, we will say equation, if there is one. And um, maybe what I'll do is tell you, what else should I do here? Let's see. I could, well, I'm really not making straight lines, am I? So we have the method, maybe we have the equation, and maybe we want to say sort of limitation. So in other words, what it's good for. Um, and then maybe we'll put a few little sort of extra details here. So the first method is the parallax method. Now that has an equation, and we looked at it, it went at d equals 1 over p. Now what's important though is that d is in parsec, and p is in arc seconds. Okay, so the distance is in parsec, and the parallax angle is in arc seconds. Now this has a limitation. Um, it's good for up to a few hundred parsec. Okay, so that's sort of, that's the parallax method. It's it's pretty good. It's actually uh, very good if you have things that are fairly close to you. It's an excellent method. Now this method uses geometry in order to sort of, in order to sort of find it. Remember we were drawing things, we were doing something like this and like this. We were finding this, uh, this is D and this here is P and that's how we did it. So it uses sort of geometry to do it. Now the next, uh, the next method, uh, well that was spectroscopic parallax. Okay, and that one had the equation that went like this. B equals L over 4 pi D squared. What's important is that that distance there is in meters. Of course, this is the apparent brightness and this is the luminosity. What's important though is that, see this distance was in parsec, this one is in meters. And its limitation, well, it's good for up to around, uh, let's say one megaparsec or something like that. I mean, it's, it's not too bad, but I mean, um, yeah, it's good for about one megaparsec. So that means one million light years, roughly, something like that. And we have this other method learned about, um, and that one is absolute magnitudes. Well, actually, I'll just say the magnitudes. Maybe we'll just call it that, magnitudes. When we did that method, that used this idea that m minus big M equals 5 log of d over 10. Remember that this time, this distance right here, that was in parsec. That's what's important here. And again, that one's good for about up to around 1 megaparsec or so. I mean, these distances, it's a little bit difficult to state the exact limitations. Okay, so these, these are rough ideas of the limitations. So those get us basically, so a few hundred parsecs, great. If you have something farther, there's probably not enough parallax for you to see it to see the, dis uh, the difference in the star. So then you have to use these methods. Now both of these methods here basically use the same principle. So they're kind of the same idea, although the equations look totally different, but they use the same principle, that something farther appears dimmer, and something closer appears brighter. And then there's a sort of intrinsic property of how bright it actually is, so that's the luminosity or the apparent magnitude. So both of those use sort of the same and they use the same physics, really. Same idea, it's just that it's written in a very different way because the scales are written differently. So 
Now we've talked about uh, those, and the most recent one I just showed you then was, um, well, that was C feed variables. Now keep in mind, there's a lot more ways than just these, but these are these are some of the the easiest ones to understand, I think at least. Um, so C feed variables, and those. Well, let's see the equation. There's not really an equation here. Um, but we do know that the luminosity or the absolute magnitude is sort of proportional to the period. That's sort of the thing that we use. That's sort of the principle that we use here. It's not really an equation, but L is proportional to the period, or you could say the absolute magnitude is proportional to the period. So once you know the period, that means that gets you L or M, and then you can use either this equation or this equation. And this is good for up to um, like we said, around 29 megaparsecs. Now this one uses this property, or sort of the idea of a standard candle. Remember that means that if you see one of these, then you know some intrinsic property of it. You already know something about its luminosity because of its period. Now you might think, okay, well are these the only methods? Well no, there's certainly more. And um, what we can do, I mean, we can, we can talk about those in other videos. I mean, we need, the idea is that we need to have some better standard candles. In other words, we need some other types of stars or other things that we can look at that allow us to peer further away. And if something's farther away, remember, this principle right here tells you that something that's farther away appears really dim. So that means that if you want to see things that are even farther than this, you need objects that are really super bright for real. And if they're really bright for real and they're really far away, then we might actually see them. So we need better standard candles and we need things that are bright. And those bright, bright things, okay, and I mean, I mean bright as in their intrinsic property. In other words, in a, here, the luminosity must be very, very large, or you could say the absolute magnitude needs to be crazy high. If so, then we might actually detect it here on Earth, right? We might actually be able to detect it. And so one of the ways it's done, uh, and of course, not only that, we need some sort of intrinsic property that allows us to know the luminosity. And one clever way is actually to look at um, supernovas. It turns out if you have a supernova of a very specific type, now remember, uh, well, I don't know if you've learned this before, but a supernova is when a star explodes. And some stars do, not all of them. So if we see a supernova explosion, it turns out there's different types. Um, and again, that depends on its spectrum. But if we have a supernova of a type 1a, it's called, uh, then it turns out we can tell something about its maximum luminosity that you're going to see in the explosion turns out that maximum luminosity is thought to be the same for all of these. Which means if you see a supernova of type 1a, if you detect one, all you have to do is look for its, uh, maybe I'll actually give you a little diagram here, just for fun. So let's say we actually detect some sort of big you know, explosion. We see some supernova of type 1a. What we could do then is if we look at its luminosity versus time, oops, sorry, not luminosity, actually we'll say here, yeah, actually, its actual luminosity, most of them sort of do a similar thing. In other words, the peak luminosity is kind of the same for all of them. Um, kind of. It's pretty close to the same. So that means if we actually detect one, and we have sort of its apparent brightness, let's say is, I don't know, really, really small, like something like this right here, at least we know that, oh, this corresponds to that maximum luminosity. So what that means, because remember, we don't actually measure luminosity from Earth. All we actually detect is the apparent brightness. So if we actually see one of these things go like this right here, then we know, oh, it's actually pretty far away. Whereas if we saw one where it actually looked like, you know, like this, for example, and we know it's a lot brighter, then we can tell something about its luminosity as well, because, of course, uh, we can use this equation that apparent brightness is luminosity over 4 pi d squared. So if this one right here and this one right here are detected. Let's say this is supernova number one here, and this here is supernova number two. We've seen two different supernovas of type 1a. One of them appeared like this, and one of them it did this over time. That's like the, you know, how bright it appears in the sky. Well, this one right here, I mean, they both have the same luminosity. So this one, because it appears dimmer, you can tell that it's farther. And this one here, because it appears brighter, that means it's closer. And in fact, how much farther, how much closer? Well, you can actually calculate that.
So this idea of using supernovas of type 1a as a standard candle is awesome. Um, and it works quite well, and it allowed scientists to be able to determine some really weird stuff about the universe. It turns out the universe is expanding in really weird ways that weren't expected. So I'm going to do some videos about that later on to talk about what we call dark energy. It turns out the evidence for dark energy came from these types of standard candles. So there's other things that we can use as well. Um, we're going to also talk about... Um, Hubble's law and it turns out if we look at uh, the distance to something well we can actually tell that from the recession speed because we're assuming that the universe is expanding so there are other ways but those ways have more uncertainties they have more errors you know so when we say a value is I don't know uh, you know a few billion light years it's gonna be plus or minus a whole lot so there's gonna be a lot more uncertainty in those methods See, the method that has the, le you know, the, the most accurate is, of course, the one that's closest. And that should make sense, because the closer you are to something, the better you can measure it. So these sort of have greater uncertainties as you go further, on average at least, as you go up the distance ladder. When I say the distance ladder, I mean, look, see here, we're only a few hundred parsecs. Now we're 1 million, we're 1 million, now we're at 29 million. And it turns out this method right here with these... Um, with these supernovas of type 1a, those work way, way farther. So those are, could be on the order of billions of light years. In other words, giga light years or giga parsecs. So that gives you just a rough overview of some of these uh, distance methods that we've been looking at so far.